Today's scripture is reading from John chapter 21, verse 15 to 25. The Church Bible turned to page 769. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than this? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Uh, John chapter 21. Well, James read the passage to us. And uh, these are Jesus' uh, final words to his disciples and In these final words, Jesus takes the opportunity, or John takes the opportunity to clear up, to clear up four issues that might well have uh, been remaining at the end of this gospel. So first there was the matter of Peter's public reinstatement after his public denial of Jesus. Secondly, there is the expectation that Jesus would return during John's own lifetime. And thirdly, there's the matter of John's identity as the beloved disciple and author of this gospel. And finally, there is the commissioning that Jesus gives to them all. So John uses these final words to deal with some of those loose ends. And these final words in this chapter are directed at Peter, at the Apostle Peter. But really they are for all who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they are for the disciples that were gathered around. And as John penned these words, he meant them for us, the reader also, to hear from Jesus these final words for our own hearts. So let's look at the passage and uh, see if we can unpack it. You notice it begins in verse 15, when they had finished eating. When they had finished eating. 
You see, they were all standing around this fire eating the breakfast that Jesus had prepared. And nothing is recorded of what was said during the breakfast. I remember once, uh, not that long ago, I went on an overnight hike with um, Raniera, actually, of all people. He was kind and generous enough to come with me. Fortunately, he didn't have to carry me. Um, but at the end of, the, at the end of our uh, night in the, in the bush, we, we, on the way home, we stopped and had breakfast at a restaurant. It was a very nice breakfast, and, and we hadn't eaten anything substantial for a while, and so you know how it is. Blood sugars get low and grumpiness rises. And, and so we didn't have much to say to each other. And so we sat down at the breakfast and, and you know, it was, a, <laughs> it was a great breakfast. You know, and we ate it and there wasn't a sound heard from either of us while we are eating. Eating is a serious business for hungry blokes. And after we'd finished, I said to Rani, you know, we could have put a wee sign on this table that said, silence, men eating. <laughs> Well, nothing's recorded of what these men said after a night of hard fishing. There they were eating and nothing's recorded of what, perhaps nothing was said during the meal. Notice it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, do not disturb, men are eating. Well, perhaps, they, perhaps nothing was said because they were waiting for Jesus to say something. Remember Peter's uh, action of jumping out of the boat and, and wading ashore ahead of the disciples? I mean, that shows that he was quite exercised about his relationship with the Lord, perhaps a little unsure about where he stood with Jesus. You see, the other disciples may not have known about Peter's denials. John knew about them because, remember, John had been there with Peter, gathered around another fire, just a couple of days before a fire on a courtyard. This time, they are gathered around a fire on a beach. So perhaps Peter jumped out of the boat and, and wanted to get there ahead of the others because he wanted to sort out things with Jesus alone before the other disciples got there. Well, if so, it wasn't to be because Jesus waited till they'd finished eating and then he said to Simon Peter, do you love me? But there's another way of understanding what is going on here on this beach. From uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, in your church Bibles, that's page 815. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, Paul is giving his account of the resurrection of Jesus and of Jesus' uh, resurrection appearances. And he lists, them, he lists those appearances for us. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 5, well, verse 4, talking about Jesus and he was buried... And he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. <coughs> Jesus appeared to Peter privately after his resurrection, just the two of them. And was this the time when Jesus reconciled Peter to himself in that private one-on-one -on -one meeting? If so, then we have an alternative understanding of why Peter jumped out of the boat ahead of them. It was to be with Jesus, with joy, to be with Jesus, with whom he had recently been reconciled. And now he was seeing him again straight after that reconciliation and was eager to be with him. And hence, you see, there's a clue there as to why Peter was hurt and concerned when Jesus persisted in asking him, in verse 17, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time and in front of the disciples, do you love me? In verses 15 to 17, we have Peter's public reinstatement. He may well have been reconciled with his Lord privately, but here was a public 
reinstatement, where Peter had to publicly confess and be publicly restored to Christ so that he could be publicly restored to ministry among the apostles. And notice in those verses 15 to 17 that uh, Jesus three times refers to Peter as Simon, son of John. Simon, son of John. Simon, son of John. There's only one other place in John's Gospel where Peter is referred to in that way. I'm glad you asked. It's in chapter 1. John takes us all the way back to the beginning. John chapter 1. And that, per- uh, that portion of chapter 1 where Jesus is calling the disciples for the first time And we're told in verse uh, 40 of chapter 1, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John the Baptist had said and who had followed Jesus. And 41, the first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. You are Simon, son of John. At the very beginning of the gospel, when Peter is publicly called to be a disciple, Jesus addresses him as Simon, son of John. And now at the very end of the gospel, when his calling is publicly reaffirmed and he is reestablished as a disciple again, Simon, son of John. Now, there's no theological significance in the fact that he's been called Simon, son of John. I mean, that was the guy's name. But see that Jesus, by putting it here in chapter 21 and there in chapter 1, was showing us that there's a link between those two occasions. This was a public calling, a public recalling, a public establishment of Peter and for the mission and task that Christ had for him. Before we leave uh, verse 15, notice the question. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? More than these. What does the more than these refer to? More than these what? Do you ever ask questions like that of the Bible? It's okay to ask questions like that of the Bible. The Bible can stand it. (laughs) It's God's word. It's okay to ask him questions about what he means. More than what? Do you love me more than these? More than these what? Well, there's three possible answers to that question. And I'll tell you ahead of time, I tend to favour the third one of those possibilities. But here we go. First possibility is, Peter, do you love me more than you love these disciples? But you see, nowhere in John's Gospel is there even a hint or suggestion that there was an issue here that Peter loved his fellow disciples more than he loved Jesus. In fact, when you read the Gospel, it tends to move in the other direction. Peter saw himself as someone special, someone a bit more dedicated, a bit more committed, a little bit braver, a little bit ready to die for Jesus than all the others. Second option is Peter... Do you love me more than you love these fish? Or the whole vocation of fishing? Was Peter to be rebuked for his suggestion in verse 3 when he said, let's go fishing? Someone told me the other week that was their favorite verse in the Bible. Well, was Peter to be rebuked for his suggestion in verse 3? But you see, this passage, chapter 21, nowhere criticizes Peter for going fishing. That's never an issue. Here the whole issue is not what Peter must stop doing, but rather what he must begin doing. What Jesus urges upon Peter here is to follow Christ. So we can discount number two. The third 
option, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Well, Peter had boasted more than once that he was more committed and more faithful to Jesus than the other disciples were. You know, I've, I've sometimes um, succumbed to that temptation to think that I'm more committed and more faithful than other Christians. I know that's never been your issue. Um, but sometimes, you know, you spend years in theological study while other people are earning salaries and advancing their careers and, and, and you think, well, it's okay, I'm just more committed than they are. <laughs> I'm making more of a sacrifice than they are. Well, see, these, these words are for me. These words are for any with um, such a temptation. And see, Peter had boasted more than once that he was more committed. He was more faithful. He was braver. He was willing to sacrifice more than the others. Well... Here in chapter 21, if he still felt that way, in spite of his recent denials, if he still felt that way, then here's what Jesus wanted him to do. Feed my sheep. If you're that committed to me, Peter, then here's the vision and here's the task. Get on with it. Don't worry about what John's doing. Get on with it. Well, Whatever that little phrase, more than these means, the conversation, as the conversation goes on, it becomes quickly very apparent that the issue here is, do you love me? Three times Jesus asks him, do you love me? In other words, where is Peter in his love for Jesus? Now, it's a question that was aimed at, the, at Peter's heart. Peter, in your heart, do you love me? Because he just a few days before, in his heart, Peter had denied Jesus. So now the question is, Peter, do you love me? In your heart, do you really love me? Do you truly love me? Or is, is your love for me in your heart kind of shared with other loves? Does it kind of compete in your heart for other loves? And so that sometimes on a bad day, your love for me is being pushed out and, and other loves are kind of taking over. Or, or do you truly love me? Peter, what is the state of your heart vis-a-vis -vis your love for me? Your love for me. Your love for me. Because unless you love me, you cannot feed my sheep. Unless you love me, you cannot feed my sheep. Do you love me? Three times. These are my sheep. Three times. Well. Wow. And uh, Peter's answer shows that there is a shift in his heart from the way things had been before. No longer does he claim his love for Christ in terms of the failure of the other disciples to love Jesus. No longer is he comparing his love to their lack of love. Rather, Peter appeals to Jesus' knowledge of his heart three times Peter says, but Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. You know the state of my poor and fail and faltering heart. You know that in my heart, in spite of all my weaknesses, I yearn to love you. I do love you. That in my heart, I do want to follow you. That in my heart, I do want to serve you. Lord, you know my heart. So in order to counteract those three denials of his heart, here's the three affirmations of his heart. And Jesus, who knows all things, knows that Peter's heart is in a different place. He knows that Peter's heart is now repentant and humbled with a love for Jesus that Peter does not compare to the love or the commitment of others. No trace of self-righteousness or boastfulness here in Peter's response. Now, you see, that's a different Peter from what we've seen in the gospel, isn't it? The Peter here in chapter 21. His heart's in a different place. You 
So now on the basis of his love for Jesus comes his commissioning from Jesus with all the disciples standing around. Do they also love Jesus? Well, yes, they do. Then this commissioning is for them as well. They also must be found feeding and taking care of Christ's sheep. Now this commissioning is centred on Peter here in chapter 21 because of his previous denials and because of the need to reinstate him back among the disciples as being commissioned along with them. It's not centred on Peter because he is to have a preeminent place among them. Nothing here in the text or in the gospel suggests this. Rather, here is Peter, the overconfident one, the denying one, the boastful one, being commissioned to feed the flock of God. Here is Jesus, the good shepherd, sharing his task of feeding his sheep with those of his choosing. We started out this morning with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He feeds me in green pastures so that I shall not want. Now here's Jesus, the good shepherd, the one who feeds his sheep, the one who feeds the sheep, those sheep given to him by God. He's the one now who is passing that task on to these weak and frail and pathetic men. But as he passes over the task of feeding his sheep, he does not relinquish the ownership of the sheep. He's not passing the sheep over to these men. He's only passing over the task of feeding them. They are still his sheep. They are his lambs by virtue of his choosing, drawing, dying, rising, forgiving, reconciling of them to himself. They are his sheep. They do not belong to any others. In Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul was talking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And in verse 28, he is reminding them of the contours of their task. Acts 20, 28. So this is what he says to these elders. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. <coughs> See, they, the sheep belong to Christ because he has purchased them with his own blood. He has shed his own blood to redeem them, so they belong to him. These are his precious lambs. They are his sheep. And the job of caring for them has been shared with these men. And so sheep and shepherd together explore and learn from the chief shepherd the contours of his love for them all. Peter's experience of living with Christ and experiencing the exposure of his sin of his denial and now of his forgiveness and reinstatement has produced in Peter a humility and tenderness that fitly qualifies him for the task. But not for him alone. Not for him only. Many years later, when Peter was an old man, he passed this task on to others that had been given to him by Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 5, page 859. 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter passes on this commission to others that Jesus gave to him on the beach that morning. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. 
You see, this commissioning was not only to Peter, but it was to the disciples gathering around, and now it's also to those other elders that Christ has raised up. Elders, <clears throat> Peter is the one who was appealed to as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings. Now, there you see Peter is recalling not only that he was a witness of Christ's sufferings, but also that it was that was the time in which he had denied the Lord Jesus. The time of Christ's sufferings was the time of Peter's <coughs> denial. And one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Peter has been reinstated. He has been reinstated by Christ, and the glory that is to be revealed to all of Christ's followers will be a glory that Peter will share in and be a part of. Verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock, that is under your care. Serving as of overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to do, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Be shepherds, eager to serve, humbly, and as examples. And finally, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. The chief shepherd, the one who owns the sheep, the one who has redeemed and purchased the sheep, he is the one who will give his glory to his sheep and to his church and to his shepherds. You see, the Old Testament job of ministry to the people of God was confined to the priests and the prophets. Now in the New Testament, all have been equipped for ministry by virtue of their infilling with the Holy Spirit. If you like, there's a, there's a general office that all believers have been placed into. A general office of all believers to, to care for and feed and minister and to encourage one another. Each one of us, by virtue of our infilling with the Holy Spirit, are in a position to feed the flock of God to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, to bring the food, the bread of heaven, the scriptures of God, and lay them on the hearts of one another and draw us closer to the Savior in joy and in love. That's, that's the general office that all of us have. And within that general office, there's a special office of service to those obviously gifted with a greater capacity to serve. And within that special office, men are raised up by God to have a ruling and shepherding oversight. So there's something for all of us here in chapter 21, that Christ's final words are for Peter, for the disciples, and for us all. Well, that brings us to verses 18 and 19, where Jesus lets Peter know about how he's going to die. Peter's call to discipleship, the call, you see, at the end of verse 19, to follow me, will come with the prospect of martyrdom. His humbling that began with the denials will go all the way to his death at the hands of others. And we're told there that, um, that in his dying, he will glorify God with a death similar to Jesus' own death. His hands will be stretched out. He will be stripped and reclothed and led to a place of martyrdom. And by his dying, he will bring much glory to God. This is what Peter is to face as he follows his Lord, a death like the death that Jesus himself endured. Now, it would seem that uh, the conversation that began around the fire, by the time you get to the end of verse 19, Jesus and Peter are walking on their own down the beach, having a private conversation. It's almost like... Um, Jesus was ready to leave the fire, and just as he left, he said, to the, he said to Peter, follow me. And so Peter followed him down the beach. And in following, Peter looked behind and saw John was following along as well with an earshot, hard on their heels. And uh, so Peter asked Jesus in verse 21 if John would also face martyrdom. If this uh, reference to martyrdom was for all the disciples or just for Peter on his own, and, and Jesus is not to be deflected by P 
Peter's question, so he reminds Peter again that the only issue that Peter needs to be concerned with is following Jesus. And so at the end of verse 22, Jesus repeats that requirement he has for Peter. You must follow me. Following Jesus, loving Jesus, feeding his sheep is of primary importance for Peter. All else becomes secondary. It's at this point the text also corrects a misunderstanding among the first Christians that uh, John would live until Jesus returned. That's not what John. That's not what Jesus is promising here. But you see, taken that way, the expectations of Jesus' return would become greater and greater as John grew older and older. That was the problem with that. As they watched John getting older and older, the expectation will be well. Um, before John dies, Jesus is going to come back again. And so you can imagine the, uh, the media scramble around John as he got older and older. How are you feeling? You're going to die soon? Jesus is going to come back soon. You see, if the two are linked. It's a huge deflection. It becomes a huge deflection from loving Christ and following Christ and feeding the sheep of Christ. And so John clarifies the situation there in verse 23. In verse 24, John identifies himself as the author of this account. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. And uh, we know that his testimony is true. We there, in verse uh, 24, the we there is a reference to the other apostles. We apostles know that this testimony or this gospel account is indeed trustworthy and carries out authority. And finally, verse 25, we have a final reference to Jesus that takes us back to the very beginning. Jesus did many other things as well, if every one of them are written down. Now, I think in verse 23, we should see that not as a reference restricted to Jesus did many other things while he was alive on earth. If we take that right back to chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Verse 3, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus has done lots of things. Jesus has done lots of things. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. If all the things that Jesus has done in the course of his being the eternal and pre-existent Son of God and creator of the world, if everything that he had done was written down, it would be more than the world could contain. The world of time and space could not contain all that belongs to the eternal and pre-existent Son. The eternal creator of all things has indeed done more than this world could ever know or contain. Well, that brings us to the end of John's Gospel. Let me just finish off with a, a brief word of application Jesus' final words to his men. After the death of Jesus, these men needed a vision and a task. They needed a sense of direction that involved a vision and a task. So Jesus gave them a vision. He gave them an adventure to live. Follow me and feed my sheep. He also gave them a task. The task was a battle to fight, to love him to the point of self-sacrifice, now I'm going to stick my neck out here and I say and say that every man, every man needs an adventure to live and a battle to fight. That's the essence of manhood, is to have an adventure to live and a battle to fight. And of course, a good woman who will live the adventure with you and stand with you in the battle. But every man needs an adventure to live and a battle to fight. And that's exactly what Jesus gave these men. He gave them an adventure to live, and the adventure to live was to follow me. Follow me and feed my sheep. What greater adventure could there be when the Lord of the universe, who has rescued his sheep from among lost humanity, then gives the feeding of the sheep over to sinful man and says, you are my people, feed my people, and enjoy the adventure of what it means to follow me, an adventure to live. He also gave them a battle to fight. Love me to the point of self-sacrifice. Love me to the point of martyrdom. Now, see, the problem with men is they look for the adventure to live in other places than Jesus Christ. And so other things in our world compete for the adventure. 
And so we seek our adventure in things which take us away from Jesus Christ. And, and, and we, we, we seek to fight a battle among people whom we have no business fighting with. And we look for the battle among those who uh, we call our enemies. Jesus said, um, you're fighting the battle with the wrong people. The only battle that you're called on to fight is the battle with your own heart. Do you love me? Do you love me before all else? Do you love me to the point of being willing to sacrifice everything else? That's the battle to fight, is with our own hearts, and the adventure to live is to follow Christ. Any other adventure, any other battle will take us out of the game. You see what Jesus is saying here? No matter your past failings, no matter your past denials, no matter your weaknesses, no matter the ways that you have stumbled and fallen, men, restoration and reconciliation with Jesus Christ is for you. The great task is still set before you. We can rise up and follow him and feed his people and know his joy and know his peace and know his love. Nothing that happens in this world need disqualify you from the task of living that adventure and fighting that battle. Restoration is available to all of us. No matter who we are and no matter what our track record, Jesus Christ can use us to great effect in his church and among his people. Whatever your sinful past, whatever your denial of Christ, he comes to you and he meets with you and he offers you his fish and he offers you his bread and then he offers you an adventure to live and a battle to fight. Will you follow him along that beach? Or will you get back in the boat and go fishing? He will humble your heart to the point of repentance and renewed love. And in humbling your heart and in breaking you down, he will lift you up to that crown of glory that the chief shepherd has for all those who feed his sheep out of a sincere and undivided love and devotion for Jesus Christ. This is the way into his fellowship and into his service. Now let me extend that beyond the male gender among us. You see, all of us are filled with the Spirit of Christ. All of us are called to follow Christ and to love Christ. All of us are being fed by Christ, the chief shepherd, and he calls upon all of us to feed one another. He calls upon all of us to follow him. He calls upon all of us to make him the great adventure of our lives. He calls upon all of us to make the sin in our hearts the great battle of our lives so that we might together live the adventure to follow Christ, together fight the battle to love him with our whole hearts and so bless one another with our lives, bless one another with our testimonies, bless one another with our ministry, bless one another with more of Christ as we feed on him so we encourage one another to feed on him also. Those are his final words. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, you know our hearts, our weak and faltering hearts. And Lord, we're overwhelmed at the prospect of your grace. Your grace is too much that you would take our hearts and use us to great effect for your glory among your people. Father, help us to believe that. Show us how to do that. Create opportunities for us to step into that, that we might prove you to be all-sufficient and all-enabling as you grow our faith and as you grow our love. In Jesus' name, amen.